9.36, welcome back to Morning Glory. Uh, we are almost at the end of the show, but we're not at the end of the show because we've got lots more to do. Uh, and I'm delighted to say uh, that we have in the studio Tom Tugendhat. Tom, a very good uh, morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, Mike. Thank it's good you. to see you. Very nice to see you. Uh, before we do anything, let's have a quick look. Uh, you are, of course, one of the four contenders for leadership of the Tory party. Let's have a quick look uh, at your campaign video. I'm standing to lead not just this party, but to be the next Conservative Prime Minister of this great country. The only way that we're going to industrialise our economy and get jobs back here is to have a Conservative revolution now. I promise you that as your leader, I will serve our country. I will lead with conviction. I will act decisively. My mission is the prosperity and happiness of the British people. Together, we can win. Luckily, you didn't use uh, any words that might come back to haunt you, like Keir Starmer did. No, well, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be careful with your language, haven't you? Well, I think you do, actually. And I think part of the reason that Keir Starmer is in such a bad position right now is because of what he said before he became Prime Minister, when he was going to be um, the man who was full of integrity, transparency was going to be the watchword, they were going to be, you know, honest, and they were going to bring the government of the people back, and it was going to be country before party, none of which is true, uh, pr uh, proven to be true. Well, he, he told us he was all holier than thou, and he's like, he's like one of those American... Uh, preachers yeah. that you get and you know the moment that they're out there saying you know they hate this and they hate right. this and you know five minutes later they're going to be found with a prostitute in a hotel yeah. room i mean you know it's yeah. one of those sort of exactly. one of those sort of stories it is it's absolutely incredible and of course this morning we wake up and i keep saying to, to, to various different commentators that we speak to uh, on, a, on a daily basis you keep expecting the story to go away but it takes another twist and you know last night took another twist because he's now giving six thousand odd pounds back thinking that that should draw a line under yeah, it and it won't but, Mike, it's not leadership. If it was leadership, he'd do that for the whole of his party. Exactly. If it was leadership, he'd go back to when he was leader of the opposition. Mm. If it was leadership, he'd actually be running the number 10 operation rather better than to refeed this story on the day he's told us that he really wants to renegotiate the deal with Europe, not in a way that I no. agree. Maybe you don't agree either. I no, don't know. I don't. Well, but, I don't. Well, again, he's so opaque about what he's doing. Well, that's true. I don't know what he wants to do. I mean, if he told us this is what I want to do, I could agree with it or not. But I don't know what he's doing. Well, that's true. But w whether you agree or, or don't, or whether you know or don't, if he's going over to do some major negotiations on behalf of the British people, you want to be focused yeah. on that, don't you? I mean, Absolutely. You know, well, yesterday patriots. I said I don't believe he's got a mandate to do it to, for a start because, you know, people voted to leave the European Union in 2016. Uh, as far as I know, they don't want to be in lockstep with the European Union. They don't want to go back in into some kind of, you know, halfway house which might be more of a single market. I just don't think people want that. Well, I certainly wouldn't vote for a single market. I wouldn't vote for a customs union. But I think what we, you know, the fundamental point is here, he's supposed to be focused mm. on what the British people need. Instead, we're still talking about what he bought, right. uh, what, you know, who bought his threads. Because he doesn't answer questions. He still, no. We still don't know what Lord Ali's relationship is with the government. We don't know whether he's still got a pass to Downing Street. We don't know what he does in Downing Street if he does go there. John Rental from The Independent said, oh, I think he's planning a party for the donors. Well, why does he need to be in Downing Street for that? And also, more, more well, worryingly... Well, Downing Street's a government building. Yeah. Government buildings should not be used for private gain. No, exactly. And more, more worryingly, now that we know that he's also been out in the Middle East doing a sort of tour, he went to Iraq, apparently, after the, the Iraq war. Uh, he also went to Syria twice, we know of, to see President Assad. On, on what basis was he doing that? And on whose command? And what was it for? We don't know. I have no idea, I'm afraid. Uh, it, we, we need answers to these questions because the truth is what we're getting from Labour now is just this extraordinarily opaque, sort of mm. shadowy sort of stuff where there's advisers who we don't know, there's right. people we don't know. But, you know, we've got Sue Gray who's doing whatever she's doing. You know, Nobody knows what she does. You it, know. It's all, you know... It's all very strange. It's and very and with every day that comes, as I say, there's more to come out of Lord Alley. You know, now we find out he gave a, a sort of a, I don't know if, he, if the loan was repaid, a loan to Baroness Udin, uh, who wrongfully claimed expenses, and because she couldn't pay them back, he gave her 62 grand. You know, he's now being investigated by the House of Lords Standards Committee. You know, it's, it's not a good look. Well, it's, it? it doesn't sound like it's the Labour Party. It sounds like it's the Alley Party, doesn't it? Well, it sounds more like the Cray Brothers, to be honest. I mean, I don't know what they're up to. It's, you know, they, they just stagger from, from one bad situation to another. And talking about Israel, for example, as we were just a moment ago with, um, uh, with the Colonel, Colonel Kemp, you know, Sama comes out quite late in the day to sort of, de de you know, condemn the Iranian attack on Israel the other day. Says we stand full square behind them. Meanwhile, his foreign secretary is preventing them from being able to get, I know it's a very minor thing, but preventing them from, from, from getting licences 
approved so that they can buy weapons. Mike, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary thing, isn't it, when the United Kingdom says publicly to the entire world that we won't stand with our allies when yeah. they're actually being attacked by a terrorist organisation and a regime that actually has set out very clearly, to be fair to the Iranians, they've been extremely clear yeah. about this, they're aiming to destroy Israel. Mm. That's what they've said. Yeah. You know, there's no secret about it, no. There's no, they haven't hidden it. They're defending themselves against that, and we're saying, yeah, no, maybe not. Yeah. That's an incredibly bad thing to do. First of all, we should be standing with our allies. Secondly, we should be standing with democracies anyway. Yeah. And third, if you actually want to have a relationship with people around the world, they need to know that they can trust you, mm. not just when things are going yeah. well, but particularly when things are going badly. Well, and because The Express today's got a piece on the front page saying security chiefs fear rising terror attacks in the UK. We're coming up to the anniversary of, of October the 7th. I've been quite surprised that we haven't seen more you know, terrorist attacks in Western Mike, Europe. you're going to forgive me. I'm not going to talk about the detail of it, but let me just, as former security minister, yeah. this was my responsibility. Mm. And all I'll say is there was an awful lot of work that went into nothing happening. Mm. OK. All right. Well, I, I can accept that, obviously, and I won't, won't press you on it. Um, but it just seems to me that, uh, you know, it is, it is a, a, a threat. It's something that we have to think about. And one of the things I believe that we get from Israel is some very good intelligence from Mossad. Um, you know, and if I was Israel right now, I'd be thinking, well, what of David Lammy? Who is this guy? Um, they've already said they're not happy about his decision. You know, why would Mossad share information with us? Well, we, we share with partners around the world, and I'm not, again, I'm not yeah. going to comment on individual relationships for obvious reasons, but, the, but we do share with partners around the world, and you're right, intelligence sharing is based on trust, mm. and I trust you. Yeah. Are, are you there with me in the good times and the bad? And if you're not, you know, that does raise some real mm. questions, and that's why we need to get leadership back into this country, because, frankly, if you're not willing to lead this country in the interests of the British people, and that... Do you know what? That may mean standing up to the left-wing zealots who want to talk mm. down Israel. That may mean standing up to those who want to put the rights of people who are trying to blow themselves up over the rights of British yeah. people. Let me be quite clear. I will always put the rights of British people above everybody else. Now, that also means partnering with allies. Yeah. Of course it does. It means standing with our allies in NATO, standing with our allies in Israel, standing with allies around the world. Because what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we're protecting Britain. And the way you do that is by actually showing leadership and showing the courage mm. to stand by your convictions. Do you think a lot of what's happening in Labour government at the moment is just down to inexperience because they literally haven't been in power? I don't think any of them really, apart from, you know, Pat McFadden and maybe a couple of a handful of other people who have been sort of brought back from the dead, as it were, of the Blair years, um, they're all a bit new at it. Well, it's not just that, Mike. It's actually they don't know what to, they don't know what they want to do. Mm. You know, you look at okay, they hate the Tories. Fine. What next? Well, they don't know. Right. You know, they don't actually know what they want to do. Right. They haven't decided. But they said they were ready for government. Well, they're they clearly said not. They had a they? costed plan. Everything was costed. It wouldn't do anything that wasn't costed. You know, and look where we are. Well, you show me where this plan is. I haven't seen it. I, I have no idea. It. You know, and and that's why when we go into when we are run, you know, getting ready to reform the Conservative Party now, when that's why this leadership matters. We need to be absolutely clear what we're trying to do. We can either go head to head with the reform, in which case, you know, we're competing over the same 15, 20 percent of the votes. That's a, that's a policy for, for, for failure. So you're not one of those who thinks that you should merge in some way? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. What we should be doing is setting out a Conservative agenda that means that we're actually attracting people back to the Conservative Party. We need to be setting out an agenda for change. And, you know, you heard four speeches yesterday. Two were variants on we should do a deal with reform. One was basically we're all, we're all right, Jack, we just need to be a bit nicer. Mm. I'm the only one who's saying we need to change. If we're not looking after the British people, what the hell are we doing? We've got electricity prices that are now some of the most expensive in Europe. I was the only one who talked about building nuclear power stations. We've got, you know, we've got threats around the world, and I'm the only one who's been talking about the fact that we need to stand up with our partners. You know, this is a time for a conservative revolution, because the truth is, the facts of life, as our hero Maggie Thatcher used to put it, are conservative. But they're only conservative mm. if you deliver on conservative values. And that means defending British people, that means standing up for British values, that means lowering the cost of energy, reducing regulation and lowering taxes. And what does it do for immigration? What's your policy on that? Well, you've got to change the economy. You've got to change the economy. Uh, Mike, I've had enough of people who tell me constantly, oh, you can change this one bill or you can leave this one treaty and it'll all mm. change. It's complete rubbish. It's total rubbish. I mean, would you cut down, for example, on the numbers of people coming here legally as well as illegally? You, well, first of all, the illegal immigration has got to stop, right? Yeah. That, but that's a question of deterrent, and Labour have let us down already on that. You know that. Mm. I know that. 
they've already abandoned the only deter deterrent that was on the table. And so now, you know, I don't know what they're going to do over the next four years, but they've made that Well, I think harder. he's going to do a deal with, with the European Union, which will involve us taking legally some asylum seekers, right? Okay, so you've just rebadged. That's what I think he'll do. But, Mike, but then you've, all you've done is just, just rebadged from illegal yeah, to legal. Yeah, it's not It's not a change. Right. The, the real question we've got to do now is we've got to make sure the economy works differently. Because the truth is... I've had enough of sitting around the cabinet table and hearing everybody going, yeah, 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 I want to lower immigration. And then you hear the health secretary going, yeah, yeah, immigration must come down, except for me. Yeah. For me, it's got to go up. Yeah. And then you hear the trade secretary going, yeah, except for me, it's got to go up. And then you hear the housing secretary saying, yeah, except for me, it's got to mm -hmm. go up. Okay, so none of us mean it. Right? So when will the Tory party accept that it actually hasn't been good for the economy, it hasn't been good for the country, it hasn't been good for the state of play in any way, shape or form? You know, everybody goes on about, oh, well, the NHS would collapse without uh, immigrants. Well, it's already collapsed. So, so actually, they're not doing any good. So I don't accept, I don't I, I, I think you're over negative there, Mike. Uh, right. We've created 800 jobs a day, or rather we've enabled 800 jobs a day to be created. Mm. Governments don't create jobs, businesses do. Um, we've enabled 800 jobs a day. We've seen the economy as the fastest growing in the G7. We've pulled out of the recession that COVID hit us with uh, the fastest. And we've yeah, but handled... none of that stands for immigration, though, is it? No, it's not. What's down to immigration is the fact that our care homes are understaffed, our supermarkets need uh, warehouse workers and our farms need uh, mm. workers. Meanwhile, we've got millions of people who don't do anything. Well, that's why, that's why I keep saying we've got to change the economy, Mike, yeah. because, you know, too many people come on your show, forgive me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a listener, but too many people come on your show and say, I'm going to do this one thing and it's going to fix everything. Yeah. It's complete rubbish. It yeah. won't. If you want to bring down migration, you've got to do what I'm talking about. You've got to do a conservative revolution. You've got to change the way apprenticeships work so you uncap them. Do you know that there's uncapped numbers of university places, but the number of apprenticeships is capped? Mm. That's nuts. Mm. We need to uncap apprenticeships so that people can train as nurses, as doctors, as whatever it is they want to be, so that they can fill those jobs in the care homes and in the, and in the hospitals. But they need support to do that. That's what apprenticeships do. We need to connect transport connections. Right. How many people do you know in your community who could, in theory, take a job at a warehouse at four in the morning because it works with their caring responsibilities, it works with yeah. their family. But there's no bus. Well, so I know, gonna do I know um, you know, my, my kids live in Sussex. Um, right. The buses there are absolutely appalling. No buses. It's 35 miles from London um, and it's what you might call the, the supposedly, you know, affluent southeast. Yeah, but there are no buses. The last bus yeah. out of the, the, the town that they live in goes at five o'clock into yeah. the town, into the big town. And, and, uh, and if you're going for a job there, one of my sons was, was uh, got a job at a pizza place, right? Yeah. Uh, he had to give it up because he couldn't get there half yeah. the time because when the trains didn't run, he couldn't go. But that's what I mean. So that's why when you're talking about getting people back into work, you and I support a change in welfare. I know we do because I've heard you talking about it. Yeah. We want to help get people out of sickness benefit and back into work. Right. By the way, just because it's We had a story you. today, 300,000 more people now off sick that's right. um, than there were last year. But it's bad for you to be isolated. Yeah. Um, it's actually meant, it, it affects your mental health. You know, we're, we're well, what about these civil servants? I mean, I'm, we could go on all day about all this stuff, but I mean, the Office for National Statistics are now complaining that they might have to go back to work two days a week in the office. They're going to go on strike because okay. they don't want to work more than one day. It's unbelievable. But, Mike, it, it's actually bad for you to isolate yourself like this. It's, right. it's actually really not healthy. And so helping people get back into work, get back into communities, get back into activity is really good for you. Mm. It's, it's actually net, totally. it's a net good. So what we've got to do is help them do it. But this sort of, you know, I'm just going to ban people from coming here. That won't work unless you do the transport connections, unless you do, unless you build houses right. so people... Or if you're going to bring people into the country, let them be people that are going to add, add something yeah. as opposed to take something away. Because we also now know um, that in many cases, immigrants become a net drain mm -hmm. on society because of the numbers of people they bring with them. Well, let's, let's be clear. There are, there are, you know, there are many people who contribute through immigration, right? We know of doctors, we yeah. know of scientists, we know of, you know, people in finance, people in various other walks yeah. of life who really do add uh, to the net. We benefit. do, but that's, a, I would say, a smaller number than the ones who come well, it's, it's and end up being more of a... It? No, it's really not. Yeah. Um, I've got a quick question for you. Richard has sent this as a voice note. Let's have a listen. Um, Mike, hi, Richard from Telford. When you interviewed uh, Tukenha, could you ask him, how long are we going to go on paying money for Ukraine? And what is our strategic interest in supporting Ukraine? Thanks, Mike. Great show. Cheers now. Richard, thank you very much indeed. I get questions like that quite a lot, actually. Okay. How is it a bottomless pit? Do we stay in Ukraine for the rest of time? What's the story? So, look, the, the, we've got a choice, right, as the United Kingdom. When we defend ourselves, do, where do you think our border starts? Obviously, on one level, for migration and things like that, it starts at Dover, it starts mm. at the coast. But the truth is, 
if you want to defend this country, the best way to do it is to push your border as far out as possible. That's why we joined NATO, right? Mm. We joined NATO to, so that it meant that we had a little bit, not a huge amount, but a little bit of strategic depth. If you're the United States and you've got an ocean on either side, you've got a lot of strategic depth. Yeah. We don't. We're an island just off the coast of Europe. So the way to protect the United Kingdom is push that out as far as possible. So that's why we're a part of NATO. Now, why Ukraine? Because when you have got somebody as evil as Putin, who has not just threatened Ukraine, but he's invaded Georgia and still occupies part of it. He's threatened Estonia. He's threatened Latvia and Lithuania. Mm. He's pushing migrants over the border from Belarus, which is, as you know, part of Russia in yeah. real in geopolitical right. terms. It's actually controlled by Putin. He's flying mi uh, migrants into Minsk and pushing them over the borders into Poland. Yeah. He's actually weaponizing migration through North Africa into Italy. If you want to stop Putin, from undermining NATO, from weakening the UK interests, and from damaging our economy, as we saw when that fuel price spike hit us a couple of years ago, you need to be willing to stand up for your values. You need to be willing to defend what is in your interest, just as we do, or just as we should be doing mm. in Israel. We should be doing the same in Ukraine. We should be making sure that tyrants don't yeah. win. Ben Wallace in The Telegraph this morning says we don't have the capability to really do much militarily uh, for Israel. Why is that? Well, a lot of that's because Israel's very, very capable itself. Yeah, I don't, they I mean, don't look like they need much help. They don't this. need an awful lot of help. So uh, the, the, the help that we're contributing is more in a sort of specialist areas that I, forgive mm. me, but I'm not going to go yeah. into. But, the, but Ben's point, and he's absolutely right about this, is we haven't got the right industrial base in this country anymore, and we need to re-industrialise. You know, let me be quite clear. We need a growing industrial economy. Last week, or sorry, was it this week, Tata Steel, it was this week, yeah, it was earlier this week, yeah. forgive me, yeah. Port Talbot. Exactly, Port mm. Talbot, Tata Steel in Port Talbot closed. Now there's only one place now in the UK creating virgin steel, and that's in Scunthorpe. Yeah. Now that is incredibly important, because if you want to build really high-end weapon systems, you need virgin steel. It's just a, it's a kind of steel that means that you can adapt and make right. it in various ways. That's the only place making it. Guess where are the other place making it is? India. India and China. Yeah. Right. Now, and we're subsidising Tata to go and do it. So they've just, they've just opened up a plant in India. Yeah. Now, India's a democracy and it's a good partner, great friend. Are we honestly saying we want to be dependent on two countries, one of which is hostile yeah. uh, and the other one is literally thousands of miles away? And can charge essential. us whatever they like for the stuff. Exactly right. I'm being told we have to go because we're running out of time. But I've got one more question. Um, you're currently the sort of underdog in the race, aren't you? Everybody said to me yesterday, James Cleverley is now the front runner. He made a great speech. Blah de blah de blah. I didn't see all of the speeches, so I can't judge them. Um, what makes you think you can win it? Well, look, I, I love James Dilley, and I've heard that speech from him several times, and it's uh, and it's a nice speech for for the Tory faithful. The truth is, we need to speak not just to the Tory faithful, but to those who went to reform, those who went to the Lib Dems, and most importantly, those who stayed at home. And we need to get those people back. The way to win this is to talk about the future, and the future is reindustrializing Britain, offering the leadership that we require to change the economy and a conservative revolution to deliver the migrant numbers that you're talking about. Tom Zuganow, thank you very much indeed. Great to see you. Thanks, um, this is, of course, Morning Glory. We'll be back after this.